<laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody um, to our Faith in the Future series today with Professor Tim Wingert. Um, professor Wingert was my professor uh, at the then uh, Lutheran Theological uh, Seminary in Philadelphia uh, when I did my internship year and taught me almost everything I know about Lutheran theology. And he's also teaching Lindsay now too at Princeton Theological Seminary. So that's pretty cool. We can compare notes and ask each other, why do you ask that question? We, I still use that, Professor Wengert, so thank you. Um, Professor Wengert is a um, prolific and prominent Lutheran theologian. He's uh, written or edited over 20 books and written more than, I'm sure well more than 100 articles at this point, Professor Wengert, um, and has uh, helped to shape the theological discourse of the Lutheran Church here in America in the ELCA and around the world, and uh, has edited um, in, in, in the time that I know of, um, our, our Book of Concord, some of our most uh, foundational texts, um, written some wonderful books, m m the favorite of which for me is um, Luther's Catechisms. I go to that, back to that book constantly. Um, so Professor Wenger, we're grateful for um, all the contributions you've made to the Academy, to our Lutheran theological understanding in this time, um, and to the shaping of many, many pastors who have gone out to uh, to be in ministry and serve faithfully, and um, and I include myself in that, and uh, and Lindsay soon to be. So thank you for being with us today. You're very welcome. So uh, I was uh, uh, actually uh, thinking I would talk about a half an hour, and uh, I noticed I had 45 minutes, and now we've basically uh, burned through uh, the time that I didn't know what I was going to say. So I should be able to do this uh, quickly enough. Um, first of all. I have ties to Upper Dublin. I've been to your congregation before and taught and even preached. Uh, I was a professor from 1989 through uh, 2013 and uh, at Philadelphia. And so, and we lived in Upper Dublin. Both of my children graduated from Upper Dublin High School. So you folks have a, a really uh, special place in my heart. And you may have uh, noticed, I don't know, uh, that I have a sling. Uh, it's not an ammo belt, it's, uh, it's rotator cuff surgery. So I want you to be really uh, respectful and, 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 so and feel sorry for me so you don't ask any real hard questions at the end. Um, also, just a word about the background. Sometimes people put in backgrounds that aren't real. Uh, this one is real. Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, two years ago, when we moved up here to Long Valley, New Jersey, what we call the New Jersey Alps. Uh, we bought a house that was built partly in 1776 and the part I'm in was built around 1810. So you see behind me a really typical Federalist fireplace. We have seven fireplaces in this house, uh, only one of which works by the way, but at any rate. Uh, so greetings from the New Jersey Alps about 25 miles east of the Delaware Water Gap which is uh, where Ingrid and I uh, now live. My late wife, by the way, was a librarian at Abington Free Library for years, and they've dedicated a room to her. So if you're ever in there, go away wandering to the back and you'll see her name, Barbara Wengert. Um, so we're gonna talk about what it is to be Lutheran. And I thought I'd start with a little show and tell. And the first thing I wanna show you um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the Augsburg Confession, and, and I collect rare books. Here is a copy of the Augsburg Confession uh, from uh, 1556, and you can see about how big it is. The, the, it was only a part of another book, and they ripped it apart, and so at any rate, but there, there you get an idea <clears throat> of the size of the Augsburg Confession. I'll be talking about that more. And Pastor Anderson already mentioned the Book of Concord. Here is a uh, Book of Concord from uh, 1580, uh, so an original, and uh, a very nice looking um, uh, front page of that. So that's another book in my collection. The collection, by the way, is headed uh, in my will, is headed for Emory University and the Pitt Theology uh, library there. It's the largest collection of Reformation uh, uh, printings in the United States. So at any rate, um, so uh, the way the Book of Concord looks for Americans is like this. Uh, this is what I edited along with a Missouri Synod Lutheran, Robert Kolb. 
Uh, so we'll be talking more about that. And we'll also be talking about some people. And since I have them here, this is a 19th century uh, look at uh, four reformers, Philip Melanchthon, who was Luther's right-hand man. Martin Luther comes next. Then standing behind them is, uh, is uh, Johannes Bugenhagen, the pastor in Wittenberg. Uh, and finally, Caspar uh, Krusiger uh, Sr., who was a Hebrew scholar and a student of those guys. So that's who we'll sort of be talking about, uh, more or less. Um, and as long as I'm on the subject, uh, some of you may have the question, well, what could we read about this, uh, all this stuff? Um, uh, the one book I didn't bring, you can tell I'm in my library, by the way, if you want to see one or two books, there they all are. Um, if you want a biography of Martin Luther, I would suggest the one uh, written, published in uh, 2015 by Scott Hendricks, who was a professor at... Um, uh, who was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary and in 2015 wrote what I consider absolutely the best recent biography of Martin Luther. If you're interested in the Augsburg Confession, here I'm going to uh, uh, just uh, toot my own horn. This uh, book came out last year and it's called The Augsburg Confession, Renewing Lutheran Faith and Practice. Most of what I say today is simply little excerpts of that book. Um, but if you want an easier book or a thinner book on the Book of Concord, my student, Martin Lorman, has written Book of Harmony, where he goes through the Lutheran confessions uh, as well. It's, uh, you can tell the difference. You see that the, the professor is down below, and now my student, uh, Professor uh, Martin Lorman, who's at Wartburg Seminary, uh, he's far more succinct than I am. Um, and that's enough of that. Okay, let's start. I have three points to make, and maybe a fourth if you force me in my uh, in the question and answer period. But let's start with three. The first, uh, it, it's as if Lutheranism is a kind of three-legged stool. It has three parts to it. Now, Lutheranism is simply one witness to the Christian gospel. Uh, there are others out there, and they also bring certain gifts and strengths. I've worked in ecumenism quite a bit, the Roman Catholic dialogue, the Methodist uh, agreement uh, with the ELCA and the United Methodist Church um, in, in a special uh, Lutheran World Federation thing uh, with the Mennonites, the Mennonite World Conference. Um, I also did something. So I think that, that uh, Christians getting along is very important, but one of the first things you have to know is who you are. And uh, the way Lutherans answer that question of who you are is partly to refer um, to this book of Concord. Um, but as I read that book and other things that Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon wrote, um, I come up with this three-legged stool that we sit upon as Lutherans, at, that we share with other Christians. Um, so a three-legged stool, the first leg of which is what I like to call up and down religion, which uh, my students, perhaps even Keith Anderson, used to nickname shoots and ladders. Um, in any case, when you came into this chat room, you came in with two religions, not one. The first religion is the one we get from our parents all the way back to the first parents in the garden, and that is what I call up religion. I'm not the first to say that. Uh, and in fact, St. Paul in Romans 10 says, ask the question, do we go up to heaven to bring Christ down? <clears throat> Excuse me, to bring Christ down? And the answer is no. Uh, who shall ascend? And the answer is no one. But still we build our ladders. We try to get up to God. And the ladders we build for the most part consists of our following the right rules, uh, fulfilling God's commandments, making the right decisions, whatever it is so that we can get down from where we are separated from God back up uh, to God. Um, this is the religion of the old Adam and the old Eve, because in the end, it's a religion that trusts in itself. Uh, two very important writers on Lutheranism, uh, Eric Gritsch and Robert Jensen, already uh, more than a generation ago in the 1970s, wrote a book on Lutheranism. 
And they called up religion something that's actually perhaps more helpful. They called it if then religion. That is to say that there is a kind of religion in our hearts, in our minds, that says, if I do this, God will do that. It's the idea that our relationship to God is conditional. It's, con it's dependent upon something that we do. If I, then God. And the problem in part of that religion, up religion or if then religion, is precisely the I. If I, then God. Martin Luther talks about this uh, in, in one of the, uh, uh, in, in one of the uh, 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 documents included within the uh, uh, Book of Concord, the so-called large catechism. Some of you know the small catechism. Well, Luther also uh, took his sermons on the catechism and made them into a book, which we call now the large catechism. And here's what he says about this kind of if-then religion, where if I do something, then God must do something. He says this, this is the greatest idolatry we've practiced up to now. Somehow I just lost my screen. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and it's still rampant in the world. Uh, it involves only that conscience that seeks help, comfort, and salvation in its own works and presumes to wrest heaven from God. It keeps track of how often it's made endowments, fasted, celebrated mass, etc. We'd have a different list, but still there are certain things that if you do these things, then God will be good to you. It relies on such things and boasts of them, unwilling to receive anything as a gift from God. And there already we hear an echo of the other religion that I'll talk about in a moment. But desiring to earn everything uh, uh, by itself or to merit everything by works, just as if God were in our service or debt and we were God's liege lords. And that's the if then. If I, then God has to snap to attention, salute, and say, yes, sir, Tim, now's the time. You really ought to do, uh, I'll do whatever you say. No, that's this conditional. Now, the trouble with up religion is that it has two results. It results either in pride, look at all the things I've done, and you've probably run into Christians like this, you know? You know, if you'd only commit your life to Jesus, then everything would be better. Or when my late wife, Barbara, was dying of cancer. You know, if you only prayed a little harder, Barbara, then, in fact, you know, you'll get better. If then, if then, if I do this, then God will do that. Pride is the one, but despair is the other result. That is to say, suddenly you say, but I can't do it. I know God's law, all 10 commandments of it, and I can't fulfill them. Those two things are the products, if you will, of up religion. But now let's get to the good news, which is down religion. God comes down to us, we do not go up to God. That is to say, it's unconditional. It's not if then, but as uh, Gritch and Jensen write, because therefore, because God loves us, therefore God sends the only son. Because the only son, Jesus, was lifted up, as the text said today in the Gospel of John, uh, was crucified, therefore we have hope. Uh, therefore we are saved. Therefore all are drawn to this crucified one. It's because, therefore, unconditional. There are no kind of asterisks, but of course you have to. Um, when talking about this, Lutherans in particular, and of course we claim, and I think it's true, that this really is the heart and soul of the Bible itself, God's grace, God coming down to us. Um, Lutherans uh, really use three uh, phrases to uh, summarize this. Um, just to, uh, a note about down religion, it's actually in the Nicene Creed, which is my favorite. I had threatened for years that when I retired, I would go around to all the Lutheran churches, break in and, and highlight these words in the Nicene Creed. Who for us and for our salvation came down. That's what even the Nicene Creed says. You see, this is not just 
Lutherans saying this. This is all Christians in one way or another. But Lutherans say it in the key of G. I mean, they just say it out all the time. And that's what really is our gift to the Lutheran, uh, to the Christian church. Um, the first phrase is sola gratia, which means by grace alone, by grace alone. God's grace, by the way, is not a power as in Star Wars, may the force be with you. A lot of people think of grace that way. No, grace is God's mercy. God's favor toward us. Did you know that in the Psalms, one of their favorite words for God is emet, which means faithfulness, and chesed, which means loving kindness, or in the old translations, mercy. That's who God is. God comes down to us as one who is faithful and merciful. And therefore, we say, we're saved by grace alone. And if you ask, how far does God come down to us? The answer is all the way into the flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. All the way to the cross, Philippians chapter 2, uh, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, Paul writes there. That's how far God comes down. Sola gratia. It's not our doing. We don't earn it. It's a gift, completely a gift, an unconditional gift, no strings attached. The second phrase is sola fide. That is, we're saved by faith alone, or better, per fidem, so through faith alone. Now, here's where Americans often make a mistake, and probably some of your good friends who are members of other congregations in the area, of course, I live there, I could tell you their names and addresses, but I won't. Um, in any case, they, they tend to think of faith as a work, as something you do. You know, God has done all this for you, now you've got to do something for God. The trouble is that always flips back into if-then religion. If I only believe, if I only do this, if I commit my life to God, if I make a decision for Jesus, then God will be good to me. Nope. And the problem there is understanding what faith is. Faith is not a decision. Faith, rather, and this I get from my favorite teacher, whose book, uh, Where God Meets Man, is still one of the best summaries of Lutheran theology there is, uh, Gerhard Ferdi one of my teachers at Luther Seminary uh, in the 1970s. Gerhardt wrote in that book, and this broke it open for me uh, for the first time ever, really. Faith is not a work. Faith is falling in love. Falling in love. It's something we do for God. I I'm sorry, it's not something we do for God. Holy smoke, you can tell. Um, I've been on painkillers for a while. <laughs> my land. That was the devil. Okay, faith is falling in love. Falling, not something we do. You don't decide to love. You fall in love. Um, you know, uh, I was widowed for three years, and uh, I ran into a former student of mine, Ingrid, and uh, we were at a synod assembly. By the way, those of you who might be widowed or, or single, and are you looking for somebody Synod assemblies, I recommend them highly. At any rate, we were at the, the assembly and Ingrid knew who I was and everything and we had drinks uh, uh, and she decided she'd flirt with me a little bit. Of course, I was didn't think about it much at all and I thought, well, isn't she being nice? You know, she, she touched my hand, wasn't that nice? This old professor of hers, uh, at any rate. And um, so I, I, I went home and in those days she didn't have email everywhere and so I thought, I, I, I opened my email on Monday. This was a Saturday that I went home from the Synod Assembly in New Jersey and, and uh, I opened my email on Monday and there was a little note from her uh, inviting me to my hometown. It turns out she was a pastor in Teaneck, New Jersey where I'd been born, but I hadn't lived there. Uh, that was just where Holy Name Hospital was. So there I was. And I thought, well, isn't that sweet? I wrote her back a nice little note and and uh, posted it on Tuesday, um, already kind of thinking, oh, this is interesting. Um, but, uh, um, and I said, you know, too bad I can't come because she, she wanted to give me this, this uh, tour of my hometown. And, and uh, I said, no, nah, I'm going up to Manhattan to visit my daughter who's living there now. 
on, on this Saturday, so I don't think it'll work. On Wednesday came a one sentence answer. Too bad, I'd really like to see you. Really? Really? I called her. My daughter's never up till noon on Saturday, so why don't we meet for breakfast? And at breakfast, I asked her, why did you send those emails? She said, I thought there was a connection. And I went, oh, I did too. And the next day we had lunch and we had a kiss. And for those of you who are widowed or, uh, or otherwise single and have a kiss for the first time after a long time, holy mackerel, if Pastor Keith Anderson had walked by at that moment and happened to have had a license, I'd have been married right then. It's faith is like that. It's falling in love. It's not deciding in love. Imagine if I'd have called Ingrid and said, Ingrid, now I've looked at all the single uh, female pastors in the New Jersey Synod, and your name came on top. I choose you. Hello? 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 Anybody there? No. It's not only Americans who say that, however. Also, when I was in Taiwan in, in 2017, helping them celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, um, I discovered that they say the same thing in Taiwan because they have a river that is called Love River. And when somebody goes head over heels, when a, when a boy goes head over heels for a girl, they say, he's fallen in Love River. Uh, and that's exactly what faith is. Faith is falling in love. It's not deciding. It's not something we do. It's a relationship. And that connection means faith alone means that it's not our works, but rather it's precisely hearing the love message of God and believing it. Which brings me to my third uh, uh, part of this, sola gratia, sola fide. And usually what uh, Lutherans have said, sola scriptura, but that's not actually right. It should say either sola Christus, Christ alone, or um, solum verbum, that is the word alone. If we just say scripture, we imagine that somehow we just have to carry our Bibles around with us and quote them a lot, and that'll be make us Lutherans. No, it's the word being proclaimed, being eaten in the Lord's Supper, poured over people's heads in baptism. That living word is in fact, that word alone is what gives us a relationship to God. And that brings me to the second stool in my three-legged stool. And that is something called the distinction between law and gospel. Um, now let's go and let me read to you first of all about up and down religion, and then we'll get right to law and gospel. In the Augsburg Confession, Article 2, concerning original sin, which you could probably translate concerning the mess we're in, concerning up religion. It's taught among us since the fall of Adam, all human beings born in a natural way are conceived and born in sin. Uh, that means to say everybody but Jesus doesn't have to do with in vitro fertilization. This means that from birth, they're full of lust, evil, lust, and inclination. All that is just standard. Everybody would have agreed with it, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, you name it. But then they add these words, and cannot, cannot by nature possess true fear of God and true faith in God. There it is. That is to say, we don't trust God, we trust ourselves. That's up religion. Article four then goes to down religion in between article three talks about Christ alone, by the way, but we have to skip that because of time. It's taught that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sins and righteousness before God through our merit, work, or satisfactions that is satisfying God's wrath, but that we receive. Do you hear the difference? Obtain, grab, receive as a gift. Forgiveness of sins become righteous before God. And here come our words out of grace, for Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe Christ has suffered for us and that for his sake, our sins are forgiven and righteousness and eternal life have been given to us. It's a gift. God comes down to us, not if then, but because therefore. But article five then is the second leg of this stool, if you will. 
to obtain such faith. In other words, how do you become a believer? If it's not a work you do, if it's not a decision you make, answer, God, again, God's the subject of the verb, we aren't, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and sacraments. Through these, as through means, God gives the Holy Spirit who produces faith where and when the Holy Spirit wills in those who hear the gospel. The gospel teaches we have a gracious God, not through merit, but through Christ's merit, not through our merit, but through Christ's merit when we so believe. Um, there's more on law and gospel however, in article 12 of the Augsburg Confession. Here they're talking actually about repentance and the way they talk about it helps us understand what law and gospel is and why it's so important as a way of understanding scripture, of understanding how God's word works. Um, concerning repentance, it says those at, who have sinned after baptism obtain forgiveness of sins whenever they come to forgiveness and that absolution should not be denied to them by the church. A New Jersey pastor, Frank Fry, who was the pastor of my wife, Ingrid, uh, used to say there's nothing absolute in the world but the absolution there. When the pastor says you are forgiven in the confession and absolution, the Lutheran congregations ought to just burst into singing or something like that. Well, um, so there you have it. Now, properly speaking, true repentance is nothing else than first to have contrition and sorrow or terror about sins. And yet at the same time, so second, to believe in the gospel and absolution that sin is forgiven and grace is obtained through Christ. Such faith in turn comforts the heart and puts it at peace. So when I talk about law and gospel, when the Lutherans do that, they're not talking simply about the law is God's commands. The gospel is God's promises. So that you could, you know, take a scissors and two baskets and you could cut up the entire Bible into laws on the one side and, and commands and promises gospel on the other. Good news. No. What the Lutherans are interested in, what we should be interested in, or what we experience when we hear God's word, is in fact, well, they put it this way here, terror and comfort. It's not what the word is, law and gospel, commands and promises, but what it does to us. Now, there is a first use of the law called the civil use of the law that the Lutherans talk about, and that is the law out here in the world. Um, the law in the world is there to keep order and to restrain evil. Uh, best example of this is when I drive uh, 80 miles an hour on, on Interstate 80. I think that's why they called it Interstate 80 here in New Jersey. Uh, along, you suddenly see some blue and red flashing lights and everybody gets religion and we all slow down to 65. That's the law restraining evil and keeping order in this world. Okay. Now, it, the signs should help us with that too, but that shows that in this world, the law also is broken because of our sin and our selfishness. But the second use of the law called the theological use of the law is always paired with the gospel. The law shows us our sin. Paul in Romans chapter three, verse 20, by the law comes knowledge of sin and the gospel then reveals the savior. So law reveals sin, gospel reveals savior. But the problem with that kind of language is that it's fairly passive. It just sits there then, and we have to kind of come up and do something. So the reformers add other ways in which the law works and the gospel works. Here, we just heard in article 12, the law terrifies and the gospel gives comfort. The law terrifies, the law of sin and of death. You can see this sometimes. Uh, my best example is always the, I think it was the 1989 World Series. My family was watching and all of a sudden the earth moved in Oakland. And Al Michaels, who was the reporter just before the game started, gets back on somehow CBS or NBC or whoever it was, it was did really well with, with all their technology. And so there he is just seconds really, less than a minute after the earth had moved. 
That's terror. And that's what the law does to us. It terrifies us. It says, you're a sinner. Sinners are punished by God. Therefore, you're going to hell. That's the law. But not just with heaven and hell, but in life, when you're confronted with things you've done wrong and are suddenly struck by it, hit by it, then suddenly you are, you just say, oh my God, why did I do that? That's terrible, you see, as well. But it's matched always with the gospel, which brings comfort. Finally, there's another uh, picture of this law gospel motif, and that is from St. Paul. And that is when he says in Galatians 2, I, through the law, died to the law so that the law kills. It puts to death the old ladder builder, the up religionist, the if then ist in us. It proves to us that we cannot earn uh, a heaven because we're sinners. And therefore it kills us. It kills the old creature, stops it dead in its tracks so that the gospel can bring life. And that is new life. And that picture is found in baptism, which is a drowning and a rising. That's why in the small catechism, Luther writes this about, um, about baptism. What's the significance of putting somebody under the water, he says, because that's the way they did it with babies. They had a big enough font. It signifies that the old creature in us with all sins and evil desires is to be drowned and die through daily contrition and repentance. And that on the other hand, that daily a new person is to come forth and rise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where's that in the Bible? Well, Romans chapter six, verse four. We're buried with Christ through baptism so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too are to walk in a new life. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's the second stool. The third stool is somewhat different, uh, third leg, excuse me. The third leg of this three-legged stool is somewhat different and it's called the theology of the cross. The theology of the cross. Now, when you hear that immediately you think, oh, it's a theology or a description of why Jesus died. Uh, it's a theology about the cross or a, a theory of the atonement as they're sometimes called. That's not what we're talking about here. And this really does go back to Martin Luther. Um, this is another little book that uh, I happen to have edited. Uh, it's the first volume of six volumes of Luther's works done in modern translation. Uh, so the annotated Luther, volume one, the roots of reform. And among the, uh, uh, among the things that are, are in this uh, book, uh, are several things that I translated, 95 Theses, Freedom of a Christian, you can read both of those, uh, but also the Heidelberg Disputation. So Luther wants to strut his stuff with his fellow Augustinian monks. This is in 1518. Uh, he's not thinking about Katie Luther yet at all, um, but instead he's talking, he's thinking about uh, religion. And so they let him uh, write down uh, his uh, understanding of things and he makes a distinction between a theologian of glory and a theologian of the cross. What we so often get on the airways and in a lot of other ways in the United States especially are Christian pastors and leaders who are addicted to glory, who think that the point of, of Christ is, is always positive thinking and going from one victory to another, woohoo, you know, um, it's the glory road. And Luther says, that's not it at all. And the text that was read in many churches, uh, Lutheran churches today, I don't know if it was in yours, from John 12 is a great example of Jesus saying, it ain't about glory. Yes, it's God's glory. And God's glory comes when Jesus dies. And I, when I'm lifted up, will draw all people to myself. That's the glory of God. And so Luther in the Heidelberg Disputation especially talks about this. This is clear, he writes. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls a thing what it actually is. A person who does not know Christ does not know God hidden in suffering. 
And that brings me to my definition, which is also Martin Luther's actually, uh, of the theology of the cross. It is the revelatio dei sub contrario specie. Now I know you all know Latin, but for those of you few who have forgotten it, the revelation of God under the appearance of the opposite. Or as I like to say, God in the last place, revealed in the last place we would reasonably look. God in the last place we would reasonably look. A theologian of glory doesn't look there, doesn't look in the manger and say, how foolish, on the cross and say, that's God? No, God would never suffer. It was such a problem among early Christians that somebody wrote a gospel, I can't remember, gospel according to something or another, uh, where uh, uh, Simon of Cyrene and Jesus switch places. Uh, poor Simon gets crucified and Jesus stands by the cross laughing. That's a theology of glory. No, God is there in suffering, there in the last place you would look. That's where God is. Your reason won't help you here. Your reasonable questions won't help, but rather God comes down to us in the, in the cross. Um, and one other thing, God comes down to us today also in these uh, places of weakness. Now, Luther, of course, gets the theology of the cross from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, into chapter 2. Um, Luther applies this theology of the cross also in the large catechism uh, that I'd already mentioned when he talks about the Lord's Supper. Listen to this, um, what he says. Now, Luther was in the middle of a fight with people who didn't think that Jesus showed up in the Lord's Supper. Um, and he couldn't believe it because Jesus says, this is my body given for you. So what makes you think that Jesus is somehow absent from his meal? Well, he points out all the reasons in the debates that he has with those folks. No, he says, here is Christ. And when his opponents say, well, well, how is he present? Uh, Luther kind of throws up his hands and says, don't ask me mathematical questions. You see, don't trust your reason to try to figure it out. I mean, how can Christ be in bread and wine? Of course, nobody will understand that. But here's what he says. Um, <clears throat> it's the word, I say, that makes this a sacrament. The word is, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. With this word, he goes on, you can strengthen your conscience and declare, let a hundred thousand devils with all the fanatics, that's his enemies, come forward and say, how can bread and wine be Christ's body and blood? There's reason, you see. Still, I know that all the spirits and scholars put together have less wisdom than the divine majesty has in his littlest finger. Here is Christ's word. Take, eat, this is my body. Drink of this, all of you. This is the New Testament in my blood. Here we'll take our stand. In the very foolishness of baptism. Why do you baptize infants? People ask Lutherans. And Lutherans answer, because it's so foolish. Child can't do anything but eat and poop. You know, and that's who we say, no, this one belongs to Christ because baptism is not what we do for God, but rather God coming down, embracing that child, just as Jesus embraced the children and said, this one's mine. This one has my blessing. And that's foolishness. So the theology of the cross is God revealed in the last place we would reasonably look. All right. Those are the three things. Up and down religion, law and gospel, and finally, theology of the cross. Those are the three legs on which Lutheranism stands. There is a fourth thing. It has to do with the two hands of God. You'll probably have to ask me to come back and talk about that. But I see I've already gone 40 minutes. I promise to go only 30. Uh, Keith is probably surprised that I actually didn't go over longer. But I'm done with my part. And I think, Keith, you can take over and do whatever you want to do now. All right, great. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to invite everybody to come back. You can turn your video on uh, and your uh, yeah, come, come back, turn your, your videos on, and I'm going to stop recording.